Welcome, everyone. Thank you for joining this panel, where today we discuss the astrological alignments leading to the important dramatic U.S. election, uh, November 5th. 2024. And today with me, we have a wonderful panel of astrology friends and colleagues who each offer a different perspective. So what is unique about this panel is obviously trying to complement each other as we each provide different types of expertise in our field. So uh, Roy Gillett is going to provide a mundane perspective, and Roy is from the United Kingdom. Uh, owner Doser from Turkey is going to mostly lean on traditional astrology techniques. Alan Anand from Canada is providing a Vedic astrology perspective. And myself from Arizona I will be providing an evolutionary perspective. And as you can hear, we all uh, come from different places in the world as well. So it's not only different astrology uh, approaches, but most of the panelists are not U.S. Uh, residents, which I believe is interesting and important perhaps to provide a more objective perspective. But I do want to highlight that as astrologers, we are human beings. And this means that we do have our bias. You know, we are going to probably have someone that we rely on more, that we uh, would prefer to see winning the election, which is our personal bias. So this is part of our uh, work. But as we present these analysis, we remain professional in keeping the bias uh, in check, you know, to to provide as objective a perspective as we can. So the fact that you know, everyone mostly, aside from me, uh, is from uh, different countries, can be interesting as far as that is concerned. Um, I just want to have a message here from AI Assistant. Okay, I'm going to get to that later. I just want to go quickly over some of the key dates for uh, the election. So we begin, obviously, you know, election day is going to be November 5th, 2024. It's the first Tuesday of the month of November is usually when the election takes place. So there are different charts to use for election day. You can get use the chart for when the poll, you know, the, the voting stations open or the chart for when the last one closes, which is going to be Hawaii State making it midnight in Washington, D.C. But you have to consider that votes are being mm -hmm. counted also through mailing ballots so the timing for the election is not really that defined you know it's it's a process the election day is more of the deadline for when you know we registered our votes and the counting can also take a while for example if we look back at 2020 um we saw that as as the votes were counted it took a while to finalize, you know, the final vote and, and it was changing, you know, at first Trump was leading and then, and the moon was in Gemini as he's a Gemini. And then as the moon moved to cancer, the counting, you know, the, the majority shifted. 
So we have to take, again, what I'm trying to highlight here is the fact that it's a process. It's not just one chart to look at. Sure. I'm going to also, um, I got that wrong. if we can all mute ourselves quickly, and I'm going to go over your bios. So this is the, the chart for the election and it's, evening in Washington. It's it's a 10 p.m. chart. And I did put the sun as the marker of the first house. Now, this is just a general chart to just see what the energies of the day are. I'm sure every one of the panelists will, you know, use something different. But as we can see, you know, usually the sun is in Scorpio. So there are two dates to pay attention to. The election day in November, early November, and then inauguration day is January 20. So usually the sun is, you know, around 10 to 15 Scorpio and inauguration day, the sun is zero Aquarius. So that's always happening every election. And so obviously candidates who have powerful alignments of these degrees uh, will be uh, getting some kind of astrological advantage. These are some of the milestones quickly uh, that we go through the dates of the year. On April 8, we have a solar eclipse that happens to also be the Chiron return of the United States. So the solar eclipse is at 18, 19 Aries, right on Chiron, on the Chiron of the United States. April 21st, a Jupiter-Uranus conjunction at 21 Taurus. Jupiter moves into Gemini um, in end of May and will stay in Gemini from zero to 21 Gemini throughout the year. August 14, there's a grand cross, immutable grand cross at 16, 17, mutable involving Jupiter, Mars, Saturn, and Venus. October 2nd, the second round of eclipses, and there's a solar eclipse at 10 Libra, square Mars on the US sun. And then on November 3rd, we have a, the start of a, seat of a series of Mars-Pluto oppositions. As you can see, during election day, Mars is opposing Pluto, and the exact conjunction is on November 3rd, the day before, at 29 Cancer Capricorn. And we'll understand why that's so significant. December 6th, Mars turns retrograde at 6 Leo. January 3rd, second Mars-Pluto opposition, one Aquarius Leo. January 15, Mars retrograde peaks, which means the Sun, Mars are in opposition at 26 Cancer Capricorn. And the last Mars Pluto conjunction in April. Then in 2025, we have a major, major alignment of Saturn, Neptune coming very close to a conjunction. They're not going to be exact on, on tropical one Aries. So, what I would like to highlight is that whoever gets elected in 2024 in the US is going to be the leader that takes us into this new era of Saturn, Neptune in Aries. Now, this is different from the Vedic perspective and Alan is gonna use different measurements. So these are tropical astrology measurements. And without further ado, I will uh, introduce now our first speaker, uh, Roy Gillett. So Roy is the president of the Astrological Association and he has published karma-based mundane astrology projection for 45 years, especially in the Astrological Association journal and his book, Working with the Planet illustrated key exact extracts alongside historical references. 
now in the working with the book um so it's it's published you can get it he has <laughs> yeah. edited english translation of andre barbeau books who is also a very well known uh and and celebrated mundane astrologer and all the details with uh is on his website you can also see the um Roy is selling the solar fire software and um, extracts from his published book at crucial astrology tools uh, co .co uk. So thank you, Roy. Thank and you. No, Roy. the stage is yours. Thank you, Morris. Uh, yeah, crucial astro tools, not astrology tools, crucial astro tools. I'm going to make a confession before I low my thing. I'm not sure if I've got the timing of the polls closing correct in my charts that follow, but it won't make a lot of difference. But we'll double check that because I've, I have a feeling that the polls close at uh, eight o'clock or seven o'clock in the evening. Is that right? In the, in the various parts of it's the seven... country. It's 7 p.m., but 7 p.m. in Hawaii is five hours from Is it? Oh, uh, yeah. Okay. yeah. Okay. Well, there's going to be a couple of hours difference on the Ascendant, but what I'm going to tell you is not that dependent on the Ascendant, and uh, I might make a few adjustments as well, but we'll see. But, like, let's uh, carry on. So, um, right, so let's start on the uh, – have I shared my screen yet, Morris? I'm not sure I have. Wait a minute. Your screen's not up yet. No, it's coming up now. All right, here we go. Okay, we okay. Got it. okay. Yeah. Right, good. So, um, yeah. Well, first of all, I just want to make the point that I'm going to give you some. The idea is to give you some mundane back down pressures. Uh, my approach to astrology is not strictly predictive. Um, I, I'm very confident that I can describe the atmosphere, the circumstances and the disposition of the people involved if I study it in enough depth. But how they'll actually finally actually work out, the, unless the pressures are incredibly intense, is very difficult to describe. So one could anticipate what happened uh, with the um, previous uh, presidential election and the uh, particularly the aftermath. In fact, I tracked it very carefully. But in fact, the actual outcome was very much to do with how people react to the situation, rather like when it's weather time, when it's going to rain, you don't know if you're going to get wet. It's up to you. You have that decision whether you go out and expose yourself. So in this way, this is what I'm offering you. Um, so, so what happens depends on the candidate's capacity to respond and make positive use of the energy. Now, I first of all looked at the closing of the polls. Um, now, this is where I think I might have the angles wrong because I, it's, it's being in England and transferring things around. I was trying to do the closing of the polls at the time that to the... Um, um, last vote was cast in Hawaii. And as Boris has reminded you, there's a five hour difference, not a, a, an eight or six hour difference like I was uh, considering. And that's what mistake I made. So it should be, this is done for four o'clock. So the ascendant is wrong, but except for the slight switch in the moon time, it won't make a lot of difference to what we're saying. And so the thing, just move that as a, Thing out. I'll get that out of the way there. Sorry. Good. It's a splash chart. There's a lot going on, but all these aspects seem to be easing. Now, this is really important, actually, because if you look at the sun to Saturn, it's separating. Mercury trying to um, uh, the nodal axis, that's separating. Venus opposed to Jupiter is separating. And it's... Um, trying to Chiron is separating. Now, the moon will be slightly earlier uh, because we've got to allow two hours back to 12 o'clock. And um, that is still separating from the nodal axis. And the Pluto-Mars opposition, Mars is just past uh, separation to Pluto. But the only aspect that's really building is, interestingly enough, the Uranus trying to Pluto. So the change is growing, but what I'm interpreting from that is that this is very much a um, 
time when the anxiety and the tension uh, around polling day is relaxing. Now, that's rather important because, as we know, the last election, the intensity built um, after the vote was cast and the doubt about it and the inacceptance of it. And even in 2000, we had a similar experience. Uh, and even when Trump was originally elected, I think this is true. So, you know, and let, except for Mars retrograding from Leo to Cancer from the 6th of December, which will be a crucial time if there was going to be any difficulty in the interim period between polling day and inauguration day. Uh, except for that, it's the only thing that is actually not, uh, has, has not relaxed its tension. And of course, that is important to note. It might be relevant. We've got December to the 24th of January. It, it, it's uh, ret it doesn't it's retrograde and it doesn't re-enter Leo until the 18th of April. So there's a lot of factors concerned with that it makes a final opposition to Jupiter at that time. So it's the issues that people are going to be dealing with after the polling day that that's about, in my opinion. And maybe a sting in the towel. Now, the effect of the election on the American state, again, allow for the time being 12 o'clock and therefore the the, this won't affect the ascendant except where the ascendant is marked in the outer uh, chart because uh, everything else, the ascendant, of course, is based on the natal chart of America. I'm using the chart that you'll recognize um, of many, many. Now, National and Progress Pluto return um, is completing uh, the transit in Neptune conjunction um, to progress moon has completed its long trine to that great natal stellium in the US chart. So a confusing time of transformation and national relationships is completing. The progress sun applies to trine the natal mercury, while transit in Saturn will trine the natal stellium. So it's going to be discipline and control to sustain and enforce a kind of new order. And transit in Jupiter conjuncts the natal Mars is in retrograde until the 4th of, Je uh, of February next year. And then it will apply to conjunct the stellium until late 26. So, I mean, there's going to be this incredible expansion of a new development. Um, I think you put this together, you can see that this election is a time where something very fundamental is going to be decided about America, which is the product of the upheaval and change that the Pluto um, uh, return and the build up of energy to the stellium has been going on for the last several years or so. And it's like this, it, it, I feel quite positive and optimistic about that as this election in this sense. I mean, unless something really terrible and frantic is going to happen and America's going to lose its essential liberal identity, it is very possible that a new kind of uh, energy that's uh, where a lot of lessons have been learned from past problems will emerge as a result of this election. Um, right, so it's going to rocky road to get there. Um, the um, Morris, will you give me a warning when I'm five minutes up on too much time taken? <laughs> okay. Um, no problem. The first one I want to look at in some detail is the. Um, Eclipse on the 8th of April 2024. That's not the first time we've had an eclipse. And don't forget that Donald Trump was born on a lunar eclipse in any case. We'll see more of that in a moment. Uh, it's not only is it so focally going across the United States of America, sort of virtually New York coming down, not, not quite on Washington, but coming down through Texas particularly. And, of course, the uh, shadow energy is quite wide, so it's affecting the whole country with it very strongly focused, going through the heart of the country in many ways. But also, it's this other planetary association, this massive stellium between Pisces and Taurus with the main focus. And this is an incredible sense of immaturity, uh, of, of, of change and transformation, uh, of, of, of virtually everything being up there, focused on there. Uh, and it's coming as a kind of eighth house, ninth house pressure. And um, now, wait a minute, that is done for four o'clock in Washington. So it might be 
take you round a bit coming back it's more on the descendant than on the eighth and ninth houses so that 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 sort of pressure but you know no, this is right because it's done for washington it had to do with the election day and it is this is the chart so it is a eighth house ninth house focus and that is very much to do with international pressures and how you get on with other people and uh, it, this could be a very frightening thing to deal with um so it's a dangerously impulsive lack of readiness could lead to disconnected aggression or maybe a tired old man agenda changing and one or both of the older men who are everybody's expecting, well, not everybody, but a lot of people are expecting to be the con contestants, uh, the candidates, um, both of them, one or both of them withdrawing or being rejected before the process to nomination is completed. Uh, uh, now, um, I'm possible candidates. Donald Trump. Well, we know his chart. Um, I, I've just put up some key words here, but uh, I, I'm limited time, so I won't go into too much depth. Unrelenting ability to say what is necessary from the full moon Gemini eclipse. Mars in Leo near the ascendant to enforce his agenda and insistent courage to brush aside anyone who distributes his leadership. Venus, Saturn, Mercury in Cancer. This is where you get the emotional dedication, his view of public service. And all points are on the left-hand side of the chart, except for the uh, south node moon in the uh, fourth. And so only he can be the right person to save the nation. This is his character. We see it in public and you see it so clearly in the astrology. So when we come to the 8th of April, as a dramatic impact of eclipse on Donald Trump's chart. The transit in stellium is opposed to his progress Libra. See his energy there is his progress energy. And there's the energy of that thing. Everything is going, the world will be against him. It'd be an inner wrestling with his pride. And transit in Pluto, which is going to retrograde early June, will oppose his progress Saturn and be coming back to oppose it again on the 14th of December. So it's an ongoing opposition between Pluto and Saturn. And even if he survived these eclipse pressures, the race will be on an uphill battle. It will be increasingly difficult to win. Um, uh, that's where he's confronted in April when that eclipse. If we look to the crows in the poles in California, and again, we have to adjust for that to our mistake that I've made. I do apologise for this. You English is what you get with English people doing American charts and getting the next time sorted out. Um, we have transit in Jupiter conjunct his natal sun and his natal and progress north node and Uranus and opposed to his natal moon. So the expansive public focus on his revolutionary standing. You can see that Jupiter there. Um, oops, something went wrong there. Come on. Um, Yeah. Dramatic change in public. Uranus applying to retrograde, re applying retrograde into conjuncts is natal midheaven. That's natal is perfectly valid. That's correct. Dramatic change in public standing and career or the direction he'll take if elected. Transit in Saturn in Pisces applies to T square is natal for moon and nodal acts in coming months. Suffering relationships is sense of himself or the US becoming a victim. You can see that with the transit in Pisces. And then transit in Mars, this is where it's, if you remember how Mars affected what happened after the 2016 election, uh, 2020 election, my apologies. Um, the transit in Mars soon to enter the 12th and conjunct his progress sand and then retrograde at the midpoint to progress mid heaven then retrograde hits progress saturn again in december and opposes the transit in pluto in january it goes direct late february as we've seen to oppose his transit in pluto re-enter the 12th house conjunct saturn and mid heaven progress and natal progress pluto april to may finally conjunct his ascendant on the uh, 17th of june next year I, one would expect a profound personal upheaval would drive him to fight harder be about his legal issues one also sense you know the whole question of whether this is an indication that he will re-in the election because jupiter is on the 10th house you might see it that way or will he be in the news because he's actually his legal problems have got better of him uh, and that is the really the big issue i think that the astrology is showing at this time now 
Joe Biden, uh, we know if we look at his chart, is natally a grand cross of Venus in late Scorpio, applying to oppose Uranus in early Gemini, both T squares and nodal axis and Chiron. Um, and then he's got Jupiter in Cancer in the eighth, trying Scorpio stellium in late 11th and mainly 12th. So the, the, I see with Biden there's this inner determination to heal and transform others is constantly interrupted by other people's problems, you know, from the family tragedies in his earlier life, right the way through to his, his one of his sons now. And because it's so much 12th hour Scorpio energy, he's very subject to misunderstanding and, and, and not feeling he's appreciated. Now, whatever you feel about the politics of it, this is the quality of the chart that I see. And some people might accuse him, as has been done, of a, a certain uh, unreliable or dodgy things because of that 12th house energy. But that is the chart that he's working with as he comes trying to become the oldest president, I think, of uh, in history. So on the eclipse state, again, allow for the fact that it should be, the transit should be four hours earlier. Transiting the Aries stellium is on his third progress lunar return. I just paused. I've thrown a lot of facts at you. And I do appreciate the people watching this presentation would be taking more time as they watch the recording to really reflect on all these facts. So I hope if it's feeling a bit much, do listen to the recording and take it slowly. Um, Mars and Saturn approaches the natal IC but trines his natal 12th house stellium, making a grand trine with the US cancer stellium. So there is, it does seem he's got, he feels he's got a lot of significance in the history of the nation. Whether in fact he thinks he's healing the nation, but has he got enough left in the tank? This is the basic question, which we all know. And the astrology is just saying what we all know in many ways. It's a make or break time for him. And this is in April. When we come to the actual election days itself, um, we've got transiting Jupiter retrograding from a trine to progress sun, north node and ascendant. And it goes direct, as we know, on the 4th of February. And then we'll try them up to April April um, 2025. Does this indicate is winning the election or missing and regressing it? It could well indicate a possibility of missing and regretting it, whether because he's the candidate or not. Problems move away. The Saturn makes a direct station on the 12th of November, shortly after the election, and then moves away from a conjunction to his progress Venus. It conjuncts his na it conjuncts it, it, it comes here. Problems move away, leaving a pleasance alive. Is this security in the present for your retirement? And transits in Uranus opposes his natal sun. So changing work experience, increasing inner focus. So I'm in two minds as to whether he is going to be the candidate. But the two very interesting transits on the day, one, and they're very much daily transits, but the transiting moon conjuncts his progress Mars and the transiting Mercury conjuncts his natal ascendant. Both seem to indicate challenging positive news. Has he succeeded against all odds? Or at least can be reassured that his worst fears have not been realised. And that is the question about... Um, Joe Biden. Now, because there was so much difficulty on Biden's chart, um, on the, the eclipse particularly, I thought it was significant to look at Kamala, How Kam Kamala Harris's chart. I mean, this is a possibility, and I'm not making it as a prediction, but there's always the possibility that she could be, to, could be gain the presidency before the polling day. And so it was worth looking at the astrology of this. And I invite anybody to consider whether there's anything in it. There may not be anything in it at all. And I'm certainly not making a prediction of anything happening to Joe Biden. But it, we, you just need to have this in your mind. And what would happen if it did happen? So on the um, she has she has a natal chart is incisive pioneering force to serve others. She's got Chiron in Pisces opposed to Uranus, Pluto, Venus in Virgo, fall. Emotional need to heal by critically changing the system the way she wants it. You don't see much of vice presidents. They don't have a high profile, but then they do do after they, you know, when it's their turn. Grand Trine, Saturn in Aquarius, Sun in Libra, North Node on Ascendant. 
in a six point there's a kind of six pointed star there with the moon in Aries, Mars in Leo, and South Node in Sagittarius on the descendant. It's effective communicator, can shift the agenda. And that's her. So she's got transits in Jupiter return to progress a natal chart following followed by Aries stellium. Now look at this. She's got a transit in Jupiter. It's returning to her progress and her natal Jupiter. And there's this whole stellium coming across. Now, I've been gabbling a lot of technical stuff at you. I've paused for a moment because that is a pretty powerful experience when you think of that. She gets a Jupiter return every 12 months, 12 years. But the power of that those other planets with it, at the, when Uranus is only just, uh, around that Jupiter transit as well. It's moved on a bit, but it's been going there. So this is something to consider. Important expansive moment. Transiting Saturn opposes natal and progress Uranus and Pluto, and also natal Venus, which is now replaced by progress Mars. Transit and Mars about to hit this. Shock brings ongoing pressure responsibility. May not be that, but yeah. Transit in Pluto squares progress mid-heaven. Others' transformation puts regenerative pressure on her career. Uh, okay, so, and then if she was ever to actually become president, then in the end, it stands as president, which is, nobody's suggesting this is going to happen at the moment, but just as a matter of interest. Transit in Jupiter is about to, but retrogrades and does not conjunct Pro Pluto, mid-heaven and north node, and then natal ascendant and North Node until late April to May 2025. It only happens once in a lifetime. Medheaven there too, will she be disappointed, you know? Transit in Saturn is direct station the 12th of 15th of November and opposes progress of natal Uranus and Pluto, also natal Venus that is replaced by progress Mars, completes on the 28th of March. Incredible so, career burden. Roy, Trace, you have... Uh... Five minutes. Yeah, okay. Thank you, Morris. And I do appreciate that there's a lot of information here. I probably over-detailed you. I hope I haven't exhausted you, but you do have a chance to listen to it again. So I'm going to just finish this one. Um, I do have... Um, so let me just very quickly point to Ted Kennedy, or sorry, Robert F. Kennedy Jr., uh, which I have... Though we don't have a time of birth. And so we have, um, but his chart, or his natal chart, without all the bits and pieces of time dependence on the right-hand side, with the Capricorn opposed to the uh, stellium of the US chart, of course, but this incredible um, uh, eclipse energy stellium in a square to his Cancer Capricorn opposition but then his cancer energy is very much coincident with America. So the question is, is there going to be a problem or the solution to a problem? And one can then, if you watch the rest of this presentation, um, I'm going to just put the slides to you so you can then consider taking along the lines that I've um, uh, been going on the previous uh, indicators you can we're showing these on the recording now so that you can at least when you're listening to the recording think for yourself applying the same sort of principles that i've applied in talking to uh, about the other candidates so here's nikki haley with her chart and i'm showing you all the things we would discuss if we had time this is nikki haley um on the event chart of the election when the polls are all in i always feel it's a good idea to decide an election result from when the polls are closed because that's when the decision is made and the count can start so these are the things that are happening to her and uh, i think i have not used quite by five minutes in doing that fast bit at the end um, I'm very sorry about the uh, getting the time right, but I think you'll find that just about everything I've shown you is reliable, except for the transiting ascendant, and therefore any charts that are on the closing of the polls will be um, uh, the, the, the wrong orientation. But of course, all the charts of the people involved are properly orientated, 
because they are the uh, tri wills are based on the time they were born. Okay, I hope that's helpful. Thank you so much. And um, absolutely helpful. Uh, it also sets the stage, you know, to understand these transits and not only the transits, but transit to progressed positions, which I find very interesting uh, in your analysis. Mm. If you can unshare the screen. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Roy. And again, crucialastrotools.co.uk for more information about Roy's work. And um, thank you so much. And now we are with owner Doser. Hi, Maurice. Thank you thank for you. inviting me. And it's great to be all together here. And thank thanks, you, thanks. Owner. Thank you. Uh, I, you know, I've worked with Owner in the past and find his approach also very valuable, a lot to learn from, not just from his interpretation, but from his techniques and how he gets to his uh, conclusions. So Owner is based in Turkey, uh, in Istanbul, and he's running a massive astrology school he's a consultant instruct instructor and researcher and author of many many books but 14 of them have been translated to english chinese and serbian and i highly recommend you know owner's book also on predictions so founder of astro art astrology school and publication on television since 2012. He has organized annual conferences in Istanbul called the International Astrology Days uh, with uh, world-renowned astrologers. And he speaks internationally, you know, at all the major conferences. He has trained more than 4,000 students. So it's it's a whole generation of uh, leading astrologers and really a strong force in Turkey. Thank you, Owner. Thank uh, you so for your, your website, ownerdoser.com and slash en for English. Thank you very much for your introduction. Now I will share my screen and I hope you can all see my slides, then I will yeah, click them. I hope it can be seen, yeah? Yeah, yeah, all good. Yeah, so I'm starting. Uh, first of all, I, I want to start with the uh, Aries ingress of the sun, and uh, which will be on 19 March 2024. And as you can see, the sun in the first degree of Aries, a fixed sign on the ascendant Scorpio. According to traditional astrologers, uh, if a fixed sign on the ascendant in Aries ingress of the sun, then this chart is valid for the whole year. But mostly later astrologers are using uh, all ingress charts such as Cancer ingress, Libra ingress, or Capricorn ingress, which I will do because it is very close to uh, the US election. But if we check this chart, we see that Sun is in the fifth house. And we see also, interestingly, Jupiter-Uranus conjunction is in this seventh house, which is 10th from the 10th. Of course, when we use Placidus houses, we see Leo on the MC, and the ruler of the sun is in the fifth. But when we use whole sign houses as traditional astrologers use, we see that because Leo is the 10th sign, the moon is on the MC. I mean, the moon in the 10th sign, I can say. So uh, a female figure will be more prominent in this time of the year, which will start from 19 March. Uh, it will be the whole year but especially for the first three months, I can say, 
And in the later charts, we will see again, uh, female figures will be at prominent positioning. Uh, by the way, the sun falls to the sixth sign in the chart. This may indicate some health problems or some difficulties or some declining kind of things for the president in general. The sun indicates presidents or uh, important authority figures, but here also, because it is the ruler of the 10th sign, it is much more related with the authority figure, the president uh, who is Biden at the moment. And the tenth from the 10th house, when we drive the houses, comes to the seventh house, which we see Jupiter Uranus conjunction, which indicates interesting changes, uh, sudden changes around that time. Actually, the ruler of the chart, the ruler of the ascendant Mars, also scores these two. So if we go on, the next chart is about the, the most important eclipse of the, of the year, the great American eclipse, a total eclipse. And as you see, many planets falls to the MC around that area, Canada, US, and around that area. So when we cast the chart of this eclipse, we see that Jupiter and Uranus are in the 10th house. And the, the eclipse falls to the ninth house and ninth sign. So I will not change my slide into the whole sign houses. So as we have seen a bit before uh, in the ingress chart, the moon was at the top of the chart and the tent from the tent comes to the seventh house with Uranus and Jupiter conjunction. Now we see that in this eclipse, it is in the tenth house, which is the house of president or the main ruler actually. And uh, when we look at the conjunction of the eclipse with Chiron, we can ask to ourselves, is it, is, is it indicating warning and or healing? Or mostly as we know today, first of all, there is a warning. And because the uh, Chiron is uh, a healer, but a warned healer. And warning of authority figures is likely. And Chiron was around 19 areas between 1970, 74, around that time. It's a long time span, of course. There was Watergate scandal at that time and President Nixon and Spiro Agnew's resignation. Of course, it didn't happen when the, the Chiron was in the 19 degree exactly, but all started with uh, around 1972, by the end of 1972, and Watergate scandal, I mean, and it continued in 1973 and ended up with the Nixon's uh, resignation by August 1974. So what comes to my mind around this time, authority figures may be wanted, or there can be some resignation, uh, or there can be some you know, uh, other things uh, for the presidency in general, this is a very critical time, which indicates sudden changes. The ruler of the eclipse, Mars, in Pisces and in conjunction with Saturn, this is another critical conjunction. April, actually, the according to me, the most important or interesting time of the year, because we will have an eclipse, Mars-Saturn conjunction plus Jupiter Uranus conjunction. And plus, according to traditional astrologers, comets are also important, their passings. So we will have a comet pass on April 2024 and another one on October around the eclipse times. So what about the comets? Uh, we don't have that much time to uh, explain in detail, but mostly comets were seen as big changes in the uh, polity and in the authority figures and their placement, uh, resignation or some new things, new leaders, and also wartime and also some earthquakes as well. So it's, it's an interesting time. April is a very interesting time. This is why I just wanted to stay, uh, stand with uh, the first eclipse of the year. And 
on the 8th, April 2024, when we have this eclipse, uh, we can see that this is just in opposite of Saturn of the US in the 10th house, which indicates the house of the ruler, and also squares to the sun, again, president or the head of the uh, uh, nation in general. And also we see that Mars in Gemini is also squared by Mars Saturn conjunction. So it's a very interesting time for the US on presidency, on some maybe explanation or some other things very important. And also warrior is energy will be turning around of that year. By the way, uh, this is the eighth house perfection for the US uh, for this year and on the 8th April 2024. Uh, what's, what are the perfection? Perfection is one of the oldest techniques of Hellenistic astrology. And for every year, we skip one sign or one house and we run around the chart. So it is the eighth house perfection where we have sun very close to it, actually by whole sign houses, Venus, Jupiter, and Sun, and Mercury and part of fortune all is there. So it's a very critical and difficult time. And the ruler of the uh, eighth house, the moon, uh, is in the third house and uh, in a cadent house. So it seems a problematic time about the U.S. economy. And as I see from the charts in general, U.S. economy is heading for recession. And the economical conditions will be very important for the election. So, for for example, New York Stock Exchange chart, we see that this eclipse falls on the moon, and around this time, Mars and Saturn is opposing to Mars in the natal chart, and the eclipse also in opposition to Jupiter Neptune conjunction, M moon and Jupiter are in opposition in this chart, and now Eclipse is on it. So it's a very critical time for the markets in general, for the economy in general, which is important for the election, uh, for the um, people who will uh, nominate, who will uh, vote for the nominees. Uh, the economy is very important. And what about the head of the nation? What about his chart? When we look at that time, this eclipse falls on the fifth house part um, in the in the beginning of the fifth, and uh, a king comes to Mercury of the Joe Biden, and also we have Jupiter Uranus opposing to his Mercury, and on the twenty April, they will conjunct in twenty one. Taurus, which is exactly opposite to Mercury of his chart. Why it is important? Because this is 10th house perfection for Joe Biden since his birthday on 20 November 2023 until 20 November 2024. So Mercury is the year old and the Aspects it takes, I mean, the transit it takes and the transit it makes are very important for his chart because it is zero and it is combust very close to Mars. And also Mar Mercury is retrograde around that time. Plus, there will be Jupiter and Sun conjunction on 27 Taurus on May 7, which will be exact opposition to his Sun. And his Pivdaria. Uh, rulers, I mean, Pyridaria period rulers are Sun and Saturn. What is Pyridaria? Pyridaria is a Persian in or origin. It's a very old technique and it's a Time Lord system. So in the Time Lord system, the Time Lords are very important. The transits they take and the transit they make are very important. So Mercury's transit and the transit it takes important by the uh, uh, by perfections and also the sun and Saturn, the transit they take and the transit they make are very important. And it, around this time, he's taking very critical transits. And there will be a full moon on uh, his 
Uranus, by the way, which indicates sudden changes, surprises on rivalry, because it is the seventh house. And also Jupiter, the ruler of his ascendant um, and placed in this eighth house, will be transiting from his seventh house beginning from May 25. So around this time, sudden surprising decisions are likely. Maybe he can step back from the race for the elections, or um, there may be some problems, struggles related with employees or health concerns, especially um, Mercury indicates uh, something related with mind or in general, Mercury kind of problems we can say, or also since Mercury rules the seventh house, something related with partners, Jupiter is also transiting there. And when we look at the Libra ingress chart, we see that the sun and the south node are in the 12th house of the chart. So sun indicates authority figures and south node indicates fall from the grace or something related with loose. And the 12th house is not a, a strong house, is not a good house in traditional astrology indicates some problems. And when we look at this, eclipse chart on the October 2, 2024, we see again, Venus is on the top of the chart for the second time. For the first ingress, the moon was there. Now, secondly, Venus is there. So I'm thinking that maybe Joe Biden will replace himself with um, Kamala Harris. Maybe Kamala Harris will take presidency from him for a while or for the later of the, uh, you know, uh, of the time after April, May. What I'm thinking uh, in May, uh, Biden may announce uh, that he may not, he is not running uh, after that time. This is a possibility, of course, we cannot know exactly. And Kamala Harris as a vice president may be there or someone else. And this eclipse fold in the ninth house of the chart, squared by Mars, by the way. But Venus, on the other hand, taking a grand trine from Saturn and Mars. So later figures are taking help, I can say, from these two. But Mars squares the sun and the eclipse degree. So when we look at the whole sign houses, it is a tenth house. And Mars is squaring there. So seventh house is house of open enemies. So there will be some warrior energy turning around at that time, probably. And when we look at the uh, transits to, uh, of the eclipse to US chart, we see that Mars is on their sun, which squares to Saturn and Mars squares to Saturn. These are very difficult transits. And additionally, Jupiter is passing from Mars degree. It's again open enemies. It's good to have Jupiter in somewhere, but this is also indicator of openings. So as I said, there is a warrior time turning around the uh, elections probably after October, November, even December when Mars retrograde. Mars will be out of bounds for a long time. If I'm not wrong, it will be 96 days. Mars will be out of bounds by the end of uh, December up to uh, April, 2025. So there will be warrior energy turning around. And when we look at the election day, as we already said, 10th house perfection, Lord Mercury is in the 12th. It's not a good placement, although by transit, it is in the first house. And on the election day, uh, he is, again, on the sun saturn feudal period. The sun is important, taking an opposition from Uranus and taking a King Kong from Jupiter, which plays in the seventh house. Only Neptune is shrining to his sun, but on the other side, Saturn is square, squaring to his natal Saturn. So all the time lords are taking mostly difficult aspects. And when we look at his solar return, uh, 
of that time because he will be still in this solar return, 19 November 2023, until to 19 November 2024. So with the election day still, he will have in his this solar return chart. So there is a, as you see, T-square here. At the apex, we see the moon in the partner's house with Saturn. So the responsibilities on the female partner, I was talking, the vice president uh, comes to my mind, Kamala Harris. And when we look at the Donald Trump's child, once again, on 8 April 2024, this eclipse is falling opposite to his Jupiter, legal affairs, and also squares to his Saturn, who is the year lord, as we will see a bit later, because Donald Trump's seven house perfection ballot at that time. And now we see he is in the seventh house perfection. Saturn is the year lord with Venus, the ruler of the 10th house. They are in the 11th house, but actually uh, when you use whole sign houses, they are also in the 12th house, as we will see also in his solar return. It's not a good placement. But on the other side, he is having a Jupiter transit from his 10th house and ASP Daria Roller Sun will be taking a beautiful Jupiter conjunction, which gives him a luck uh, to get the uh, presidency. And next, when we go into his solar return, we see a difficult solar return on that time. It will start with, uh, from the 13 June, 2024. And when we look at that, we, we can see that there, there, there are likely quota pairs fall from grace or behind the skis, skin activities or secret relations or presently or lose popularity because these three are in the 12th house of his chart. And when we look at Kamala Harris chart, we see that although he has Saturn passing from the and house because he is or she will be in her first house perfection after 20 October 2024 when he is 60 years old first house perfection so to have Jupiter passing from here although retrograde is a good thing she has not known over here and Jupiter will be trining to his sun as well as to his Mars and Mars is also one of the rulers of Fyvdaria at this moment. And probably he will, she, she may uh, take some additional responsibilities or, or uh, fall from the grace. Sometimes certain trances are taking it and uh, bringing it uh, with itself. And there is, there are four eclipses actually in 2024, but one, almost lunar eclipse on 17 October 2024, which, uh, as you can see, holds the angular houses when we cast the chart according to Washington, D.C. So it's it's really very powerful. So around that time, there will be some big struggles. Of course, there is an election, but maybe there will be some open enemies of the U.S. as well. And when we put it on to Kamala Harris chart, we see that her sun moon opposition takes a green square uh, from the planets uh, that mostly, uh, you know, Pluto Mars oppositions are very strong. Now she's taking a square from these two and plus the uh, lunation. I mean, the full moon is on her moon and the sun. But having Jupiter still on the sun now, it, May good luck, may indicate good luck, still good luck. And for her solar return, when we look at the perfection year lord, as we have seen just here, because the first house perfection, Mercury is the year lord. And when we put Mercury as year lord to the solar return chart, we see that. It placed in the 10th house, which is a powerful placement. And, and also the sun, very close to the MC. And in the 10th sign by whole sign houses. Of course, it's not easy because uh, the sun will be squaring, will 
take some squares from Mars and Pluto as well as Chiron. But on the other hand, and Jupiter will be trining to her sun as well. And on the integration day, we see Sun-Pluto conjunction at the top of the chart around 12 o'clock. Of course, when we look at that, uh, the first thing, I, uh, what comes to my mind, at least, Donald Trump, he's a Plutonic figure. So I was asking to myself, will Donald Trump um, win the election? Because here we see a president who has uh, a Plutonic energy. And of course, the moon will be in Libra, Uranus will be around the ascendant, uh, as always, because uh, mostly Taurus is rising in this time of the year. And when we look at the Pluto-Sun conjunction of the inauguration chart, we see that it is very powerfully on the Jupiter-Saturn conjunction, which occurred in 21st December 2020, uh, indicates a big change uh, in general. And when we look at the Joe Biden's chart for inauguration day, his perfection is changing to 11th house. The moon is there helping him. But the uh, Pudaria rulers also are changing. The sun is the same, but it's not Saturn anymore. It is Jupiter. So it is better to have Jupiter at this time as the uh, sub-period ruler of Pivdaria, but that ruler, Jupiter, is taking a conjunction from Mars, which is a difficult uh, conjunction, actually. And Jupiter will be transiting from his seventh house during the next uh, half of the year and around the integration day. Uh, yes, this is a good luck for, but is it this good luck for the partner or opponent? We are not very sure because we know that his opponent, mostly Donald Trump, and Donald Trump has the son in Gemini. So this may very well help to Donald Trump uh, against Joe Biden, actually. And when we look at the inauguration days transit over Donald Trump chart, to have Jupiter around the MC, the 10th house is good. Uranus may bring some surprises and retrograde by the time we have Uranus retrograde, Jupiter retrograde, Mars retrograde. It's a very difficult time, by the way. And uh, the year law still, uh, it is Mer uh, it is year law is Venus, by the way, and taking Mars conjunction on that time. And the moon is, yes, on uh, his Jupiter trying to his sun helping. And when we look at Kamala Harris chart, Jupiter is on the ascendant, still first house perfection. Pudaria rulers are Venus and Mars, and her Mars taking almost a uh, sextile from Jupiter, at least uh, maybe in the days ahead. And she has still Saturn uh, on her 10th house. And on the day of integration, Libra moon is Iran, her son, helping. And just one chart I made, since I don't have the exact birth time of the other candidates, and, and I'm just uh, looking at the chart of Gavin Nielsen, and I see that he is in the 10th house profession with Jupiter on it, shining to his sun. And he will be uh, on Pivdaria periods as Venus and the moon. When we look at their uh, transits, they are passing from the fourth house in angular house. By the way, year Lord Mercury again, once again, he has part of fortune also in the 10th house. Mercury is also having a conjunction from the sun around the election day, which can which can be told that it's it's good to have that. And when we look at his solar return chart, uh, the same sign on his natal chart is rising, although this is the 12th house, but 
the first, this is the same sign as in his natal chart, which indicates a support from coordinator for this year. Although we have Uranus very close to the MC and says ex expect the unexpected and opposing to Venus, the ruler of the MC, still he has Jupiter trying to his son and Mercury, the ruler of the Asana, which is good. And when we look at the inauguration day, uh, we see that Jupiter is close to his MC by whole science houses in the 10th sign. And the moon uh, on that day will be around his sun once again. Although there are some difficult aspects, he is having some good supports from the planets in general, I can say, or less difficult transits than the others. So what I'm thinking at the end, looking at all these charts, if we have Trump on the election day, and if we still have Biden, the most uh, you know important candidate, and if they are opponents in the election, if you ask me, Trump uh, wins. But if we have Trump and Harris, maybe Kamala Harris will be there instead of um, Joe Biden, if he backs from the uh, nominee. And if we have Trump and Harris, Harris, how, Harris has more chance relating to uh, Joe Biden. She has a bit better transits, a bit better protection and Pyrdaria rulers. So if we have Trump and Harris, she has more chance according to Donald Trump, but still Donald Trump may seem a bit more powerful. But if we have, let's say, Trump and Newsom, then Newsom has more chance uh, in this uh, race, uh, according to Trump. So I can say it, it's around 50-50. So, of course, these are, these are my opinions. Uh, we will see at the end. So I hope I didn't pass my time. Morris, uh, you perfect. didn't warn me. But... <clears throat> okay, so it, it was a bit quick, but uh, since we don't have much time. No, I mean, I think it's good to have you know, to focus our, our information, which you have done beautifully. And maybe, you know, we will have another session in October to a uh, part two um, to kind of complete this because there are so many charts to look at, so many candidates. Sure. And, um, but thank you for, Thank you. Not only the analysis, the techniques, and also for some interesting conclusions. Thank you. Thank you. So Alan from Canada. Um, Alan is a Canadian astrologer, palmist, author with extensive experience in both Eastern and Western astrology. He's a graduate of the American College of Vedic Astrology and a former tutor for the British Faculty of Astrological Studies. He's written three books for Western Sidereal Astrologers. So it's sidereal, but it's a Western version called Mutual Reception, The Draconic Bowl, and The Passionate Planets. Um, another seven books on Vedic astrology, plus seven mystery novels, including his New Age Noir Trilogy, whose hero is an astrological Sherlock Holmes. He also writes celebrity profile and currently event article on his website, navamsa.com, provides educational posts on his YouTube channel, and you should check his Instagram. Um a lot of information, good sense of humor, and a different perspective for us who are 
tropical astrologer. So now we're looking at things from a very different angle. So thank you, Alan. The stage is yours. Thanks so much, Morris and uh, Roy and uh, owner. Thank you for your presentations. That's a hard act to follow, but uh, <laughs> I'll do what I can. Uh, okay, I hope my screen is up on board here for you all. Yeah. Um, let's see if I can advance my slide. That'll be my first challenge. There we go. Uh, I must give thanks to my teachers, uh, without whose, uh, without uh, their instruction and uh, guidance, I would not be here. Hart Defoe, my Jyotish teacher, his guru, Mantraji. Um, as uh, Morris uh, indicated, a uh, bit of my background, uh, sort of a hybrid astrologer, was originally a Western astrologer. I got my diploma from the Faculty of Astrological Studies back in 1980. I hate to say that, but that's a fact. And I, I functioned as a Western astrologer solely until about the mid-90s when somebody gave me a book on Vedic astrology and I read a bit of it and I almost threw it away because uh, it converted all my fire uh, sign planets into water signs and it made me sick to read that <laughs> and I almost gave up right there but I persevered and I realized okay this actually seems to make some sense so for a number of years I uh, was really a hybrid but then I, I converted uh, slowly but surely to Vedic astrology uh, to such a degree now that I, I scarcely know where Uranus, Neptune and Pluto are in the zodiac anymore because I simply pay no attention to them. Uh, as Morris indicated um, I'm a fiction writer as well and have wasted uh, so much of my 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 years uh, writing novels until uh, Hart Defoe's uh, guru said, stop writing novels and living in an imaginary world and start to write uh, books on astrology. I protested at the time. I said, I don't know anything. And he said, uh, nonsense, uh, write articles first uh, and then you will write books. And uh, And so it has come to pass. Uh, there's a few of my books, uh, three books on Jyotish, uh, uh, middle three books on Western Sidereal, and uh, another three books on the uh, the mystery series, which, uh, which incidentally, um, you know, they're entertaining, of course, but they have a lot of astrology, palmistry, numerology, and many other arcane um, subjects of uh, divination embedded in, uh, in that entire series. Okay, I'm going to tackle the Republicans first, and <clears throat> on that note, too, I would like to um, uh, quote uh, George Carlin, uh, that uh, famous um, American comedian, uh, who said, um, when you're born, you get a ticket to the freak show. When you're born in America, you get a front row seat. So nowhere, uh, it seems, is this more true than in American political life, where it sometimes seems to be a bit of a circus act. Uh, but so it goes. It's from for those of us <laughs> north of the border, it makes for, you know, entertaining uh, and compulsive viewing uh, to uh, quote another uh, famous comedian. Um, we could think of uh, Robin Williams who uh, once said, you know, uh, Canada uh, is like a, a nice apartment wherein polite people live over a meth lab. So that's a, that's a swipe at America, but, you know, it comes from an American. So I, I'm allowed to quote it and not be criticized for that. Okay, let's have a look at some of these uh, principles in the Republican camp. Now, I'm going to miss Chris Christie. Um, he announced his uh, withdrawal from uh, the race just the other day. Uh, but I did like his chart. Uh, and, oh, for the record now, I'm just going to show you what we're looking at here. So on the right hand um, is what we call a North Indian format of um, um, a horoscope where, oddly enough, the ascendant is placed in this upper uh, portion of the diamond. Uh, but then the signs follow in, you know, the astrological order that we're used to seeing in Western charts. But for the benefit of uh, <clears throat> those who are not familiar with this format, uh, every horoscope that I will present here uh, displays it <clears throat> with um, the circular chart, the ascendant on the left hand, where we're used to seeing it. Bear in mind that these are sidereal chart positions. So if you're familiar with anybody's chart from the tropical zodiac, uh, 
suspend your um, judgment for the moment and uh, remember that this is all from a sidereal point of view. Um, I don't indicate uh, aspects here uh, just because I do not want to clutter these charts. Now, um, so there's no Uranus, Neptune, and Pluto in, in these horoscopes either. Take note. <clears throat> Why do I like Chris Christie's chart? Uh, two things uh, make of him uh, make him a great man. Uh, Venus, uh, lo Lord of the Ascendant, is in its own sign Libra in the first house. Uh, Saturn, uh, Lord of the Fourth, is in its own sign uh, in the fourth house uh, Capricorn. These two create what in uh, Jyotish or Vedic astrology are called the uh, Mahapurusha Yogas, where um, um, a true planet, uh, Mars, Mercury, Jupiter, Venus, or Saturn, occupies its own sign or exalted sign in an angular house or a kendra. And it makes for, um, typically, a person who is a bit of an archetypal figure. And, uh, you know, Venus in the first can give diplomatic skills, charisma, uh, Saturn in the fourth house, uh, strong moral responsibilities, and, um, you know, good governance and so on and so forth. Now, Christy, God love him. Uh, I, I consider him a bit of a, an American hero. If we, uh, you know, go to a, a wartime analogy, uh, Chris Christie is the guy in the trenches who, when a grenade falls in among him and the rest of his buddies, he throws himself on the grenade and sacrifices himself for the good of his um, his patrol. Chris Christie, from the outset of his campaign, has campaigned largely against Donald Trump, calling out his uh, various bad behaviors and pressing hard on that and doing a service, I think, to the other candidates who were running alongside him, but refusing to criticize Trump um, for fear of agitating MAGA world. Now, Christie uh, paid the price of that. Um, he's currently running uh, the major period of moon. This is called a dasha. Major periods in Vedic astrology called dashas. Minor periods are called buktis. So I'll go back and forth saying dasha or bukti, meaning major or minor period. But the major period moon, um, moon is debilitated in the second house. This is a propensity for a person to speak uh, harsh truths. And I think he's paid the price for that. Uh, minor period, Mercury, Mercury in the 12th house of loss. Uh, a game, you know, he may have had skeletons in his closet. If it persisted in his race, they may have come out. But, you know, he saw the writing on the wall. He's uh, losing, you know, electoral support and probably uh, financial support as well, too, and chose to bow out. But I will miss him. Um, then on to another candidate still in the running, uh, Vivek uh, Ramaswamy. Now, a lot of these people I've uh, either written about uh, for my website or and or I have uh, done posts on them for my um, my YouTube channel. Um, got a lot of interest in uh, Vivek uh, Ramaswamy, perhaps simply because my posts are mostly about Vedic astrology and it draws a large uh, Indian crowd. Um, Vivek Ramaswamy, although he's still in the running, I kind of dismiss him uh, on the basis of two things. He's got two debilitated planets, Jupiter in the second house, uh, debilitated in Capricorn, Mars in the um, eighth house, uh, debilitated in Cancer, also widely combust. This particular axis of these two planets, Mars, uh, Jupiter, uh, both um, weak, and in a you know stressful relationship with each other, um, I think encourages on his part a certain sort of bombastic uh, stage presence, where he said any number of outra outrageous things. You know, he he uh, poked fingers in uh, you know um, Nikki Haley's eye, alluding to her daughter's you know presence on social media. He outraged all Canadians, myself included, by saying that the U.S. should build a wall between Canada and America. What? To keep out Canadians? Are you crazy? <laughs> uh, we keep your tourist industry going. Uh, anyway, uh, he's he's a smart guy, uh, but he said a number of uh, outrageous things. And I think he's sort of uh, trying to be uh, both a innovative uh, reformer and also a, a kind of a, a nationalist at the same time. Uh, I don't think uh, he will be uh, around for long. Um, 
with the solar eclipse coming up in April, I think this is going to shake up the whole campaign for a lot of uh, contenders. And um, <clears throat> by then, a number of these um, caucuses uh, in various states will have taken place, uh, including Super Tuesday will be behind us, I think, in March. And uh, there will be fallout. And I think uh, Ramaswamy will be one of those that will uh, fade from the scene. Donald Trump. Um, yeah, okay. So Donald Trump, uh, as many people know, was born under a lunatic eclipse, and he continues to exhibit those behaviors uh, for the past six, seven years, as long as he's been on this particular public stage. Um, Donald Trump has one of those unusual horoscopes, which um, in Vedic astrology is referred to as a Kala Sarpa configuration, or in Western astrology is called a draconic bowl. Uh, bowl. Uh, that's when you have uh, the Rahu K2 north-south uh, axis, basically splitting the horoscope in two and all the, the remaining planets, the visible planets, I must add, we don't include Uranus, Neptune and Pluto, uh, but all of the visible planets uh, roughly in that half of the horoscope, while the other half remains vacant. Now, Kalasarpa, draconic bowl individuals, tend to become sort of larger than life creatures. Uh, they, they represent archetypal figures of uh, some kind. They do include many successful people. They also include a lot of rogues as well, too. Uh, Bernie Madoff, you know, who was the architect of a massive Ponzi scheme that, you know, uh, devastated the financial stability of uh, so many Americans uh, five some years ago. Um, Benito Mussolini, who was uh, extremely arrogant and uh, basically uh, took uh, Italy to ruins by partnering with uh, Hitler in World War II. Um, uh, who else? Ted Bundy, psychopathic murderer, serial killer. <laughs> you can sense my bias, perhaps. But, you know, there are good good people among the Kalasarpa draconic bull types. But uh, there's, there's a lot of problem cases as well, too. So Donald Trump, I mean... Um, uh, He's, he's a bit like a zombie that despite an, a number of, you know, shotgun wounds and, and so on and stabbings or whatever, he's still going. Um, so he's currently running a Jupiter period. Uh, and uh, Jupiter, you know, it's a benefic planet uh, occupying a positive neutral house. Uh, it, for reasons I won't try to get into, well, I'll, I'll briefly say this, that uh, in the scheme of Vedic astrology, um, uh, there's a notion that a, uh, a period lord will give the results for the dispositor of the nakshatra in which it sits. Um, now, the nakshatras, there are 27. You can think of that as being a kind of a subtle zodiac of 27 signs that underlays the, um, the, the, the 12 signs in the zodiac that f we're familiar with. Anyway, Jupiter, um, by virtue of this sort of uh, adherence to uh, nakshatra lord dispositorship, will act on behalf of Mars. Now, Mars is basically a rabble rouser in many ways, and this has been Trump's game right from the outset. Um, and um, currently, in Trump's minor period is K2, which is in a sign of Mars. And K2 always acts as a kind of a proxy for whatever planet associates with it or disposits it by sign or nakshatra. So Trump is currently running major period Jupiter, minor period K2, both of which invoke Mars. And Mars is the fighter. It's the angry man. It's uh, the trooper, the soldier, uh, the rebel, the renegade. Uh, Mars has always been... Uh, seen as uh, something of an unpredictable force, you know, going way back, centuries back, where Mars' orbital position was very difficult to understand and make sense of. Uh, but uh, Trump continues to play this card of being angry and aggrieved and summoning up uh, his people, uh, you know, firing up their anger and grievance as well, too. And, you know, his his latest campaign is basically, I'm going to be your agent of retribution and vengeance. Um, so this is going to continue for some time until, you know, into September. Now, 
when I look at Trump and I see the mounting, uh, you know, problems uh, that are being um, laid upon him, you know, in the form of legal issues, the fraud trial in New York, which is coming near to an end and is going to penalize him something like a quarter billion dollars or perhaps more. And then he's got, you know, the Georgia interference trial. He's got the um, the uh, other trial vis-a-vis uh, -vis the uh, January 6th uh, insurrection. This is pretty substantial stuff. And, you know, some of the major corporate donors, uh, you know, the, the Kosh brothers are, are deserting him. And much of the sort of normal electorate are starting to look at this guy, I think, as being a bit wonky. I mean, I'm no great student of, a, of the American political arena, but I think I can rough it out something like this. A quarter of all Americans are registered Republicans. A quarter of all Americans are registered Democrats. A quarter of all Americans are registered independents. A quarter of the remaining Americans have never voted and are never going to vote. They just don't care. They're cynical. They don't believe. So you're left with, you know, three quarters of the country that's got to make these votes. Needless to say, Democrats are not going to support Donald Trump. A lot of independents are going to look at him as well as being a bit of a wild card. And, you know, his proven, you know, I mean, basically, he's got his hands all over the insurrection and the Georgia interference. It's hard to see how he's going to wiggle his way out of that, except perhaps a contaminated jury pool. But we'll see. Um so meanwhile, uh, what he reminds me of is what happens in civil engineering school in university is where the civil engineering students build a model of a bridge made of wood, and then they begin to stack weights upon it, representing cars, loaded trucks, trains, loaded trains, until basically the whole thing crashes under the weight of um, uh, the the cargo or the traffic that's put upon that bridge. Well, something like this is happening to Donald Trump in real time. You know, Donald Trump came to fame with, you know, his reality show, The Apprentice, and he's basically just continued the reality show of America and turned it into a giant political spectacle. And that's where I like to invoke uh, George Carlin again. You know, it's a fantastic freak show where we really don't know what's going to happen next, but it's going to be dramatic. So uh, here's Trump. Um, I believe that, you know, um, the, the wheels are going to come off his cart uh, sometime over the course, you know, between uh, late spring and late summer, where it's the cumulative effect of more and more of this is going to become problematic for him to continue. Uh, Despite MAGA world's insistence that almost cultish belief that he's our guy and we're going to follow him lemming like over the cliff there's a lot of you know sensible rational republicans you know george bush mitt romney chris christie adam kinzinger liz cheney i mean some of these were stars of the republican firmament and they've been you know cast aside um you know in in the light of maga world biases but i believe this cannot be sustained we'll see um, now, I had to have a look at Nikki Haley and Ron DeSantis. Let me dispense with DeSantis first. We do not have birth times for DeSantis or uh, Nikki Haley. So I caution you that what I'm using here are hypothetical birth times based on a certain degree of rough and ready uh, rectification based upon, you know, observable uh, behaviors and personalities. Ron DeSantis, for the record, I'm using 6.07 a.m. So this gives him uh, Sun and Saturn and Mercury in the first house, uh, Leo. And although I believe he's got leadership skills and administrative uh, skills, basically because of the Sun-Saturn um, association, He's an arch conservative who is adamantly anti-liberal in every respect. And it's that sort of thing, I think, that is going to doom him to some regard. He's against everything that Democrats propose, whether it's, you know, immigration or abortions or, you know, uh, uh, freedom of education and, and other matters of choice that, you know, matter to many Americans. 
So, um, and ultimately, I think he lacks the personality to be able to carry his campaign to fulfillment. So I think after um, <clears throat> the eclipse in April and many of these um, you know, caucus events in the Republican field, we'll see further support eroding for him, both electoral support, both financial support, uh, and that you know, his light will be fading. Now, Nikki Haley, I find extremely interesting. Uh, okay. I'll admit it. I've got a crush on Nikki Haley. <laughs> I'm not a Republican in heart or spirit, but boy, I do love her moxie. Uh, now, again, be forewarned, I'm using a hypothetical birth time for her. That's 3.36 in the afternoon. Let's not obsess about actual times, but I mean, this is where I've tweaked it. Now, let me justify this briefly. Um, so if that's a Gemini ascendant, her, her Lord Mercury has gone to the seventh house. This is a classic sort of configuration for an ambassador, a diplomat, an agent of change. Nikki Haley, need we be reminded, was the ambassador to uh, the UN, US uh, American ambassador to the UN. There, Mercury joins with Jupiter. Jupiter itself indicates in, in Sagittarius a certain degree of wisdom, good judgment, um, the ability Ability to abide by the rules of law. And again, this predominant seventh house emphasis that uh, arises from this hypothetical chart gives her great diplomatic skills. And I think she served the country well during her time uh, as a U.S. ambassador to the United Nations. And I think she can carry this forward uh, because I, I admire her intelligence. I admire her verbal facility. Boy, it's a delight to watch her in some of these debates where she really punches back. And speaking of punching, take a look at the midheaven where, well, 10th house, she's got moon and Mars together. So in Vedic astrology, this forms a combination called a Chandra Mangala Yoga. It's just a fancy phrase for moon Mars um, association or moon Mars alliance. Now, what it basically implies where moon is indicative of the personality and Mars is that sense of fighting spirit, enterprise. Uh, this indicates a person who is the opposite of a couch potato. It implies somebody who's got verve, energy, get up and get at it sort of uh, capacity. Mars in the 10th house enjoys directional strength. Mars is one of the so-called Kshatriya caste planets, which is rulers and administrators and the capacity to govern others. Um, Mars influences the ascendant here by a special, you know, uh, Vedic astrology aspect. And I think this is what gives, you know, uh, Nikki Haley so much energy. You know, admittedly, uh, all four of these particular planets are in dual signs, you know, and I think she has a bit of a tendency to, you know, sometimes talk out of both sides of her mouth. Show me a politician who doesn't have to do that. But man, she's really quick on her feet and, you know, has a great command of the facts. And I think she's a, a very capable person to go forward. And I think this is what the Republican Party needs as well, too, is a woman, because there are some critical issues for American, you know, abortion rights for one of them, that I think a woman um, can best speak to that and address that whole issue on behalf of American women. So I think she's a powerhouse. Uh, she's currently running um, Venus major period, Rahu minor period. Uh, Venus occupies the ninth house. This is the house of legislative capacity, the judiciary, uh, good fortune as well, too. And so I think she has that going for her. Uh, Rahu, as a sub-period lord, is, uh, you know, not so substantial. It's going to give uh, results for Sun, which is, you know, a sort of a generic indicator for leadership. And it's going to give results for Saturn as well, too, which doesn't enjoy a strong position. And I think ultimately... She can give a good run uh, for the party's money, but I think ultimately she may not be successful. Uh, let's go to the independents, and I'm not going to give them much time because, you know, uh, I, th I think independents should stand down and not get in the, the race. Robert Kennedy, uh, you know, here I didn't even bother with the proper rectification. Uh, as we do in Vedic astrology, if you don't know the birth time, rotate the chart to place the moon in the ascendant and use that as the functional ascendant. Moon in Gemini, 
you know, I know he's got some clear positions on vaccination, and I'm not sure what else. I don't think he's done a very good job of making his platforms obvious. Uh, his Senate Lord Mercury gone to the eighth house with Rahu. And, you know, I think he's seen as a bit of a quirky duck. Mars and Saturn together, uh, you know, this is somebody who like gets in the car, turns on the ignition, puts the car in gear, and then puts one foot on the gas and one foot on the brakes at the same time. The car goes, but effectively doesn't go nowhere. And I think that's what's going to happen to his campaign. The other big uh, independent, Cornell West, black man, I think very brilliant man. Again, I've done the same thing with his chart. Just put the moon in the first house. His Lord Saturn goes to the, uh, to, to the ninth. That's good. Uh, and he's got a big cluster of planets in the fifth. I think this, this man is basically an intellectual and, uh, you know, professorial type. And I think he'd make a great policymaker and a strategist uh, or a secretary of a department. But I don't think he's going to get his hands on the levers of power. Let's get on to the Democrats. Um, Joe Biden. So, you know, uh, Biden... Uh, when he won the uh, last election, he was running uh, the period, the major period of Jupiter. Jupiter enjoyed a stellar position um, uh, in his horoscope. Uh, it does still enjoy, but it's time has passed, we might say. Jupiter is uh, exalted in Cancer and in the ninth house. <clears throat> this is, you know, great fortune. It's the house of legislative capacity. It roll, it rules the uh, fifth house, which, you know, uh, suggests, you know, subject matter expert or conversancy in, in many, uh, you know, uh, fields of, of government. Uh, the, he has his 10th Lord in the first, you know, that, that as well as a sort of an indication of uh, rulership command and control uh, capacity. But Jupiter's time has passed. He's now in a Saturn uh, Dasha. Uh, Saturn Dasha, both major and minor periods. Now, <clears throat> Saturn occupies one of these nakshatras ruled by the moon and will give some of its results during its period. So the moon occupies the sixth house. And I think this is the spoiler for Joe uh, that uh, since the outset of um I think it started in uh, 2021, his uh, Saturn Dasha. So, you know, every time I see him, I think, wow, there's America's favorite grandpa who, who needs a nap. And, and you know, he totters around and I sort of worry about when he's going to fall over. Uh, and I think uh, health problems are, going, are arising for him. And I think they're going to continue to arise. And I think before uh, the summer is over, he's going to bail out in some way. And what's going to happen then? Well, um, he, he needs a successor. And I don't think it's going to be Kamala Harris. Kamala Harris has been so low profile as to be invisible. Um, you know, um, those who work with her don't like her. She doesn't have any sort of uh, great appeal for the public. Uh, and although she's a woman, uh, and I give her, you know, um, points for that, being able to carry that cause, and she's got experience in government. Um, you know, she was... Um, you know, uh, um, basic district attorney, attorney general for, for California. And that's all well and good, but I don't think she's going to be able to carry the day. She's running Rahu, uh, which uh, major period in Mercury. And that's all right. But I mean, I, I think uh, she's a little bit of an oddball now, and I don't think she will be, you know, inheriting uh, Joe's position. Uh, nor will she uh, be around for, you know, uh, to take over his role. But here's somebody I think is a contender. And I talked about this in my YouTube uh, post on him a couple of months ago. Uh, and I simply ended up with Gavin Newsom because like owner, uh, I was interested in like in terms of significant uh, players, who else has a known birth time? Well, Gavin Newsom has one. And lo and behold, he's got quite a strong chart that fulfills one of the classic Vedic signatures for governmental office. And that is when you have a combination of Lord of five or nine or 10 together. So that would require Jupiter, Mars, or Venus somehow being coupled. Bingo, we have it right here. Jupiter and Venus. Jupiter, Lord of the Fifth. This indicates sort of, you know, the ability to manage, to, uh, manage a portfolio um, and being a subject matter expert. And Venus being that command and control disposition. Jupiter and Venus fill the bill for this particular uh, um, 
combination actually forms what we call a Raja Yoga, a kingmaker. Lo and behold, the amazing thing about this, Gavin Newsom is currently running Jupiter Dasha and running the Venus Bukti. So the very two planets that indicate his potential to be a, uh, a significant leader. He's already done a term as a governor of California. He's in his second term. Uh, back in November, he did a debate with um, uh, Ron DeSantis. I don't know why this was engineered, but basically you have an avatar of liberal wokeism in America. I mean, basically California has got it all. Sanctuary cities for immigrants, for women who can't get abortions in, in red states, uh, LGBTQ rights, you know, uh, you know, uh, climate change initiatives. It goes on and on. Every, you know, sort of advanced liberal ID in America pitted against Ron DeSantis, who's against everything like that and is trying to be a hardline conservative. And basically, you know, uh, um, Newsom pretty much, you know, trumped, uh, sorry, I didn't mean to use that word, but, you know, uh, triumphed over um, DeSantis throughout that debate. And I think this was a test to see what he looks like on the national stage. I think sometime over the course of spring to summer, when Biden bows out, Gavin Newsom might very well be anointed his successor and suddenly appear. And so I think the race may come down to Newsom versus Haley uh, in, the, in the final election. And uh, given the uh, tailwind behind him, I think uh, Newsom is possibly the next president of the United States. Thank you. I've stated my conclusions. Won't need to go into that. Okay, thanks. Thank you. Well, that's interesting. Thank you for, uh, you know, we didn't speak about our presentations prior to this day. We spoke about the logistical details. So it's interesting to see Owner and Alan um, supporting this turn of events. Um, so... Thank you for a very interesting presentation and informative astrologically as well. And so, yeah, Maurice Fernandez uh, takes the mantle here. Um, some of you, most of you may be familiar with my work, <laughs> Evolutionary Astrology, and unlike a lot of uh, our my colleagues here, I do see... I've done a lot of work around the 12th house and Neptune and see that as prominent signatures in uh, the mundane world and public stage. And so I'm going to address that as well. So, you know, you, my website, mauricefernandez.com, I'm going to highlight some resources and one of them, speaking of which, speaking of the 12th house, there is an article on my website. You go to the tab article that says winning with the 12th house, um, which is part of this um, research that I've done, highlighting the importance of Neptune and the 12th house, especially, you know, if we look at Biden, who was elected, I'm going to just bring his chart now for a moment, who was elected in 1972 as a senator, as the one of the youngest senator when Neptune went, was on his ascendant. And he was elected as president in 2020 when Neptune was on his IC. So very angular Neptune. And he was elected with Obama as a vice president when Neptune squared his son. And right now, Neptune is going to trine his son. And as, you know, a 12th house Scorpio in particular, um, like Roy was mentioning, there's a tendency to underestimate them. I think I've heard so many predictions about Biden dying. And yet, you know, as a good Scorpio, especially Mars in Scorpio, he keeps resurrecting. He keeps being there. And, you know, we'll see what the stars have to say for this time around. But he's definitely one to be the surprising um, outcome. And 
we also have to understand that people like Trump and Biden, who are now, you know, uh, of the Pluto in Leo, early Pluto in Leo generation, they are aging differently. There's something about the Pluto in Leo who want to continue, you know, they're not ones to give up. They are very, you know, they have the fire in them. And there's a sense of calling and, and destiny that they don't want to accept their mortality, you know, and so um, it changes the political landscape. And interestingly, you know, the generation born in the 90s with Uranus, Neptune and Capricorn are, on the other hand, gaining world stage at very, very early stages. So you have, you know, the Pluto in Leo who are not going anywhere and, and they're, you know, moving into their late 70s and 80s and continue to be influential. And then you have this younger generation of 25 to 35 year old who are the youngest prime ministers in the world and the youngest um, leaders in, in different capacities. So it's an interesting contrast. Um, I'm gonna come back to this day, but just Ref, you know, referring back to that article on the 12th house, how 12th house people are usually the unexpected leaders because they usually do it not because they want to show off, but they do it because they don't have a choice. And that's part of what Bi drives Biden. And he says, part of the reason I'm, you know, I'm running again is, is because of Trump. And so there's, for him, in his world, there's kind of this altruistic, sacrificial, you know, I have to do this. I have to show up because otherwise, you know, I have to save the day, which is a very 12th house thing to be the savior. Um, going back to the election day chart, uh, Alan was talking about, you know, how the drama of the United States uh, political world. And I think that the U.S. has the longest election process in the whole world. Like it takes at least a year, if not more, uh, of processes and election and, and, you know, Super Tuesdays. When you follow other countries' election, you know, it, it takes a month two months to to run a campaign and go to the voting poll and it's done and over. So there's this kind of extended forever, you know, examining everything and, and you know, it's a large country. There's, there's a lot to do, but it is indeed adding, you know, it's like material for drama. And it will be dramatic because not only the length of the campaign, but this Mars-Pluto in Leo opposition. Remember that Mars is the ruler of the North Node. So it's not just strong because Mars is strong in any election, but it's highlighted by the fact that it's um, conjunct the North Node. And so we can expect polarization. We can expect, you know, things not to go smoothly and to have scandals and polarization, unfortunately. Now, Mars is not just opposing on the day of the election. We're talking about, you know, a five to six months period where Mars is gonna retrograde from six Leo to 17 Cancer and go three times opposing Pluto. Um, and that affects the charts of all the candidates. So there will be a lot of unexpected development. Looking at, you know, one of the main drama activator, uh, Donald Trump, who like has been highlighted here, is, is fighting so many fronts, you know, personal, business, insurrection and 
there's something to be said about, again, a 12th house Mars, and now the transit of Saturn and Neptune in Pisces is the martyr card, martyrdom cells. So the more people throw arrows at him, the more he uses that as leverage to use his victimization to gain sympathy and power. And so it, it you know, it, it's part of this, again, 12th house strategy um, to be, you know, to bring unexpected results. And both Biden and Trump are, you know, are, it's true for any leader, really, when you are in a position of leadership, you, you get fuel from action. This is true that whenever, you know, the these people are in the front stage, they will be on, on adrenaline rush. And the moment they're out of the race, they crash. And this is why they still go strong because there's a lot of adrenaline that keeps them going. And the moment, you know, something will get them out, whether they lose the election or whether they retire, you will see that their health will may likely decline after the fact. So that's just a side note. So we talked about the different dates and we, you know, our, my colleagues mentioned how April is a game changer and I agree with that. Uh, I'm gonna refer to you to another, um, another, video on my YouTube channel, which is not only the fact that the uh, that the eclipse is conjunct Chiron 19 degrees exact, like to the minute, like 1924, but it happens to be a Chiron return for the United States. And like owner was saying, Chiron is a 50 year cycle. The last time in 1974, we had the Watergate scandal and Nixon's scandal. And this time we have, you know, gun control issues, second amendment issues. And, you know, the United States known to be, um, you know, this is the chart of the United States, the fourth, the Chiron is in the fourth house. It's called the land of the free home of the brave, which is very Aries, you know, home of the brave, land of the free. Sounds like a fourth house, Aries, and Chiron, you know, the maverick. So this Chiron return brings a lot of this question about, you know, what is the land of the free and how do we maintain our freedoms, and whether it's the freedom to bear arms, whether it's the freedom of you know my body and abortion issues, whether it's the freedom to you know read the books that I want to read, etc. So a lot of questions about whether we are wounded in our freedoms or whether we are maintaining and protecting our freedoms is going to be important. So watch this YouTube video on the Chiron return of the United States. Um. What I believe will happen in April as a game changer is not just internal politics. I think the Middle East situation will reach some kind of climax. And I've spoken to about that in my 2024 forecast. I believe Benjamin Netanyahu will face an intense crisis and may have to step down. Um, and this will affect the Middle East uh, situation, whether it's going to be the end or, you know, of, uh, of Netanyahu or whether it's going to be the end of the war, uh, something, there's going to be a turning point and we can hope, please pray that it doesn't inflame into World War III. 
because these eclipses crossing the United States and in Aries with Chiron are obviously volatile. I don't think it will go there. I don't think it will go out of control. But this Mars Saturn in Pisces suggests war in at sea. You know, we already see that, you know, with the canal of Suez, um, with the, you know, the Yemen rebels shooting and retaliation. So we, we can expect Mars Saturn in Pisces to affect um, warfare at sea. So... <clears throat> Uh, obviously, you know, the Middle East situation will impact the, um, the U.S. election to a degree or another. What I also believe, uh, based on, you know, some of what um, Owner was saying with, you know, I, I, I won't repeat the same equinox and, and charts, but I... I I, I do learn from them as well. And I agree with Honor that women in this election are going to be prominent. But my, my analysis and my intuition says that this will most likely promote Nikki Haley, uh, more so than Kamala Harris. And we're going to look at... Um, Nikki Haley's chart. Now, what is interesting is that there are so many of these either vice president or, or candidates who have a 29 or 27 Capricorn placement, which is Pluto. And we talk about a Mars-Pluto opposition, you know, that's going to go back and forth between October and, and January. And it's right on her nodes and right on her sun. So she's not going anywhere. You know, she's not going to fade into the background. She's center stage. Whether she's going to be the front runner of the Republican or whether she's going to be the vice president for Trump. I believe that if Trump chooses her as a VP, I mean, he's going to it's going to be a smart choice for him. Uh, but in one way or another, it looks like she's in the front stage and it looks like it, she's not very happy because this opposition means scandals and means polarization. And even though it's a strategic choice to possibly be Trump's VP, when you look at their sinistry, Nikki Haley's Saturn squares Mars Trump's Mars at 26 Leo. So she's going to constantly put the brakes on his bravado. And his Saturn in Cancer squares her Mars. So they have a mutual Mars-Saturn square, which doesn't bode well for a successful, you know, cooperation. They're going to butt heads, most likely. But from a strategic point of view, you know, if... She is his VP. It looks like, you know, it's a good bet for him to gain popularity. Now, let's look at Donald Trump. And as you know, there's going to be a Supreme Court decision on whether he will be eligible to be on the ballot in the first place. And that Supreme Court decision, you know, is, I believe, supposed to be on February 8th. And what we see is Mars opposing his Saturn Venus, at least leading up to, and it's also quincunc his Mars. So he has a Mars, Mars quincunx, which creates a yard with Neptune. So Neptune 26, Mars 26, all locking on his natal Mars in Leo, which we all agree, you know, is really strong for him. I mean, his Mars... Um, is, is what makes him so recognizable. He's outspoken and brave 
and abrasive and, you know, brings strife wherever he goes. His son in Gemini is exactly on the United States Mars, which adds to the constant agitation. But this, this yard doesn't bode well for him being eligible. And yet, later this year, as Jupiter moves into Gemini, we see that he may bounce back. So there, there's some kind of weird dynamic astrologically with Donald Trump where we see his hands tied and him not being able to really, you know, gain the uh, support. You know, all, all the planets are going to move into his sixth house the Pluto and the Venus and the Mars into his sixth house. And the sixth house is not a, a house of popularity. So it's more of a house of, I have to fix my plumbing and I have to go to the doctor and I have to, uh, you know, pay my bills. So it's more of a practical house. It's not so much about leadership and, and prominence. But later in the summer, you know, past the you know the this this April phase, there's a return to uh, prominence, and so I don't know. You know what will end up being whether he's not going to be able to run or whether he's going to be weak, but then later you know be on the ballot and reverse the decision. That's something to consider. I want to bring another period into our focus. And here in August, we have a grand cross involving Mars Jupiter. Now, Mars Jupiter means religious wars. And I don't mean that literally. I simply mean that in the fact that people are Im immensely passionate about their ideologies. That happens to square Saturn. And we know that Saturn, Jupiter le relate to legal issues, to politics, to governance. And so the moon on that day will also be opposite, exactly Mars. And so this is again, an extremely volatile time and it happens to be right before the democratic convention. So going back to the dates, on March 5th, we have Super Tuesday, which is the first step of the primary elections. July 15, the Republican Convention. And August 18, four days after this Grand Cross, the Democratic Convention. So 16 Gemini, you know, there's going to be a lot of war of words a lot of war around immigration, Jupiter, Saturn, immigration, Gemini, and a lot of misinformation. Gemini, Jupiter, you're going to have people basically lying, lying, lying. You're going to have foreign in, you know, intervention and the Russian bots pushing for all kinds of conspiracies you know, we can expect a lot of misinformation with Saturn in Pisces, a lot of deception and trying to basically manipulate uh, our minds, Gemini. Um, but in general, we see agitation. We see people worked up. And this can have to do with unrelated issues. You know, it could be foreign policy. It could be the Ukraine Russia thing and, and the Middle East. So it doesn't only have to do with campaigning, but it will affect the campaign trail. Now, all this happens to land on um, Donald Trump's Uranus. So let me, first of all, just looking at Trump and Biden, you know, their face probably going to face up again if, you know, unless there are really unexpected deviations. But it's interesting to see just their sinistry that Trump's Mars is square Biden's sun. 
and Biden's Chiron and nodes are on his Mars. So you see these two from an evolutionary point of view, they've been enemies for centuries. <laughs> you know, it's not just now that they're facing off. Uh, it's kind of a repeat story and, and it keeps repeating also twice in this in this campaign. But going back to, you know, the Grand Cross, it lands, oh, I don't know where I put that chart. Oh, here it is. It lands on Trump's Uranus. So that whole Mars, Moon, opposition, square Saturn, the victim, you know, poor me, everybody's against me. And then agitation, Mars, Uranus, Jupiter, you can expect a lot of war of words, bombastic statement, and um, and and the sun coming on his Mars as well. So again, Trump is not going anywhere. Whether you know he's held back earlier the year, uh, it seems like he's going to be in. You know whether. But, whether you know eligible or not, he's going to be uh, very frontal. So I'm looking here at the Mars retrograde cycle, and I'm seeing you know these are the three oppositions. So the first opposition at 29 Cancer Capricorn on November 3rd, the second one January 3rd, and the third one April 26. Along with that. I trust you can see here the January 5th, the peak of the retrograde, Mars opposing Sun on January 15, just ahead of the nomination. This happens to be, look at this degree, you know, it's Nike Haley's Sun, and it's also Robert Kennedy's Sun. So both Nikki Haley and Robert Kennedy have a late 27, 29 Capricorn sun and that Pluto Mars is gonna hammer them. And that means they're present, they are fighting, you know, there's something happening and they're, they're not just, you know, upset about the mailman, they're in, in the political scene. So a word about Kennedy, you know, he's gathering a lot of support and it's it's not clear whether he's siphoning votes from the Democrats or the Republicans. You can have a lot of people disillusioned with Biden who will go for Kennedy and you can have a lot of people disillusioned with Trump who will go for Kennedy. So it's, you know, he's kind of a wild card that way. Um, and and Pluto being on his son Mercury, um, you know, is going to stir the pot. Not only that, he has Jupiter at seventeen Gemini, which is where that big August Grand Cross is happening. So he's going to have a Jupiter return with this Mars, you know, uh, Mars Saturn square on his natal Jupiter. So it, it looks like whether there's gonna be scandals, whether it's gonna be another conspiracy, you know, and, and war of words and misinformation, um, in one way or another, he's gonna gather a lot of attention. Just a word on Ron DeSantis. I agree with what was said is that by, you know, after the spring, he seems like he's going to fade out. You know, this is his solar chart. We don't have a time of birth. So the sun is on the ascendant. And by mid-April, as all these eclipses are happening, you know, Saturn and Mars are opposing his sun and basically sinking his ship. A note on another Democratic candidate, Marianne Williamson. She's also a 28 degree Capricorn, but it's a moon. And so that Pluto, Mars opposition is going to activate her moon as well. Now, 
she's not, I don't think she's going to be very prominent in the race, but I can see her, you know, being vocal and being involved with what's happening. So Kamala Harris is very important because she's born on a full moon, 27 cardinal, Aries Libra. And Pluto has been squaring that opposition for the whole term, you know, since she was, since 2020 election. And that's part of the reason I believe, like Alan was saying, she's not popular, nobody likes her. And she's not really uh, showing off strongly. And that Pluto is, you know, squaring is really affecting her popularity. Now, Mars is going to be adding to the Pluto. So Mars, Pluto opposition is locking on her natal full moon along with Jupiter coming close to her ascendant. On the election day, Venus is also on an angle. So my sense is that she has strong presence in the election. And she, you know, it seems like if she is the VP for Biden, um, she's showing strength for the election time, but there's going to be a lot of internal battles conflict, polarization, whether it's maybe, you know, policy problems or whether there's something more dramatic happening. You know, we have to examine the fact that this eclipse in April and the eclipse in October, uh, let me go back to this chart. The eclipse in April on Chiron and then the eclipse in October. Um, do I have the chart here? This is uh, the Republican convention and whether, you know, Trump, this is at the time where the nominee will make his speech. And so Venus... Sun is going to be on Venus for Trump and Jupiter at the top. You know, it looks like it's positive for him. But going back to uh, Kamala Harris, um, what I want what I want to say basically is that this Mars retrograde is volatile and could lead to battles. And I don't mean just television debates. I'm talking about protests. I'm talking about not accepting election results. Um, it's fiery. And I hope it doesn't mean you know, the worst case scenario of assassination. But it's it's not quiet. So we live in a time where all these charts, Nikki Haley, Kamala Harris, Trump, you know, Robert Kennedy are all extremely agitated in ways that are not just showing an election campaign trail. It's extreme in my opinion. So let's go to Biden and see uh, what's showing for him. As I said, you know, he, Neptune is usually on his side. The 12th house has always played to his advantage. You know, the Scorpio sun during election time, the sun is in Scorpio, is usually around his Mars and, and stellium, which gives him an advantage. Interestingly, most US presidents, the great majority have Mars in Scorpio and Mars in Leo. So both Trump and Biden have that signature. As owner was mentioning, and, and I believe Roy, uh, Mercury is gonna be on his ascendant the day of the election. And Mercury is the ruler of his 10th house, which has to do with 
status and prominence. It's in Sagittarius. So there's a level of confidence there. Um, Mars is going to retrograde back and forth on his Jupiter. So there's something happening. You know, there is some kind of battle. Uh, but Neptune is trining his son in the fourth house. And another thing I wanted to show, you know, some of my colleagues mentioned that possibly, I know he's he's not going to be the nominee. And I, I think I, I have, I differ there from that point of view. And that's because I checked the Democratic Convention date the time where the nominee accepts this, you know, the his role. And so his nomination acceptance speech is on August 22nd, when the sun is exactly on his north node to the minute, to the degree. And Venus is right on his MC. So I don't think he's going to be fading out. You know, it looks like he's accepting you know, the solar position of the sun on his north node. And so, yeah, I, I you know, looking at, at that, I do believe he's going to be the contender. I do believe that he's going to, you know, run as predicted by with Kamala, unless, you know, because of these Mars opposition, Kamala is not the VP, and maybe, you know, I haven't checked Gavin Newsom's chart, but if, you know, Alan and owner say that he's so prevalent and prominent in the race, maybe he's going to be the VP. I cannot, you know, I'm just, I haven't checked the chart. But my sense is that because as Owner was saying, Moon and Venus are so prominent. I think women will will be prominent in this race. So closing arguments, uh, looking at Trump's chart. Um, for the election, definitely Jupiter being in Gemini will give him a boost, but Jupiter is both expansion, but it's also legal issues. So Jupiter is not just, you know, happy and jolly. It's, it's a wild card. And so what, you know, will Jupiter give him the advantage of winning the election? Possible. You know, we, we cannot underestimate the power of Jupiter on your sun and north node. It is uh, a strong card for him. But I do believe that Biden also has strong cards. And so I, you know, given the circumstances, and, and I'm also looking at the future of 2025, when, as I mentioned, we are going to enter a period of Saturn Neptune in Aries. Now pay attention to that degree one and zero Aries, how it falls into the candidates. Uh, my sense is that, you know, it is going to be a new era. So um, I hope we're going to have a part two where we can get into more charts and more details, and we can also narrow our scope if we do this again, um, maybe next October or September, October. In the meantime, I invite you to explore the 12th house. I'm going to lead a online seminar on understanding the 12th house starting in February 24th until April 6th. It's a 13 session uh, seminar. Also, end of this year, a major conference at Omega uh, with great speakers. Uh, check it out. And so thank you, everyone. And let us pray for the best outcome for this 
country and for the world. A lot is at stake and we can only hope that whoever leads the country will do so responsibly and for the you know for the greater interest of the people not themselves blessings everyone and thank you to honor alan and roy for excellent and inspiring presentations thank you very much thank you thank you everyone thanks morris bye -bye. that was great thank bye you. bye bye everyone